All right, thank you all for coming. So before we get started, I need to make our requisite fire exit announcement. Please note the exit locations nearest you and find one if you need to use it. In the event of a fire alarm or other emergency, please calmly exit to the public concourse area. Emergency exit stairwells leading to the outside of this facility are located along the public concourse. For your safety in an emergency, please follow the directions of the public safety staff. I think there's a continuous delivery joke in there somewhere, but hey, you deploy your concourse where you want. All right, who's this guy up here? My name is Jonathan Regeer. I've been with Garmin for about seven years as a senior software engineer. I've been in the industry for about 20 years. This is my second go around with CF. The first one was with Cold Fusion in the 90s. It was great at the time. I like Cloud Foundry a lot better. Who's Garmin? We are a almost 30-year-old tech company. We do about uh, $3 billion in revenue every year. We serve uh, five different markets. So we do outdoors, where you can uh, purchase dog training equipment, handheld GPSs, bow sites, things like that. <clears throat> um, we also do really cool watches. Uh, one of the neatest things about our new watches are our quick fit bands. So it's easy to take your band off. You can have a nice silicon band for that run that you do. And then when you need to dress up to go out, take the same watch, put a leather band on it, and you're good to go. We also integrate our products. So uh, that bow sight, you take a shot. The bow sight figures out the angle of your shot and then determines uh, from that where the location of that shot went. And your watch gets a location, and you can use your watch to navigate to that. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, we're also in automotive, both on dash and in dash. We are also in boats. We do um, chart plotters, uh, um, uh, fish finders, depth scanners, things like that. We also do autopilots. We've got some really cool automation between the watch and the boat. So if you're standing at the front of your boat and deciding that you're not liking where you're heading, you can adjust your course from your watch. Pretty neat. We also do uh, a lot of airplane stuff. So all the way from autopilot to the glass cockpit, uh, we do all of that as well. We're in some small planes like experimental stuff. Uh, you can put us in your four-seater Cessna, or you can put us in a Learjet. We're, we're in all those platforms. Garmin uses two flavors of Cloud Foundry. We, we are a pivotal shop. Right now, our production workloads are all running on 110. We've got two, I'm sorry, three 2.0 foundations up and running. Uh, our plan is to have those taking production traffic within, um, within the next month or two. Here's a quick roadmap for the things I want to talk about. By the way, I'm going to try and keep it to 15 minutes so that anyone that wants to attend the diversity luncheon will have the, uh, you won't have to miss anything here. So I want to talk about some pain points. We did some things wrong. We'd like you to learn from them so you don't have to do them as well. Uh, automation helps you do more with less. Uh, we want to talk about um, how we've won with the platform, what running for, at scale has looked like for us so far. And then um, probably last but not least, why does all this matter? This presentation, uh, Sesame Street, is brought to you by the number 100. We'll get to that in a little bit, so stay tuned. The first, pain. So Bill Gates in 1981 said that 640K ought to be enough for anybody. If we fast forward a few years, we decided that, hey, a slash 24 is a lot of IPs. That should be plenty to build the foundation, right? It was for a while. Now, understandably, uh, the Verizons and the Comcast and they were probably thinking like, what, what do you do anything with a Slash 24 for? Garmin's not quite that size. Our, our scale's maybe a little smaller. So Slash 24 seemed like a really good idea at the time. But quickly, it looked like this. So as we moved more apps into the platform and, and those apps got bigger and bigger, we eventually realized that uh, that was not going to be enough IPs, especially when you consider that uh, underneath of Cloud Foundry, you have compilation VMs, which claim an IP whether they're running or not. And their job is to build new VMs for the platform. And because of repaving necessities, every VM that's actually running in the platform has two IP, or there are two IPs allocated to it, the one that's running and the one that's going to be rebuilt. So quickly, we look like this. So we talked to Pivotal and came up with the idea of using isolation segments as a solution to that problem. So to add IPs to a running foundation uh, isn't possible. It requires an outage. An isolation segment is kind of like a mini Cloud Foundry that sits beside the main one. Uh, you can route to it the same as, as the original one, but it has its own routers and its own uh, Diego cells. So we thought, ooh, kind of like cloning the platform, 
except we get to keep everything. We were hoping it would work out like the uh, picture there. Ended up more like that. So, and that's not on Pivotal, that's not on Cloud Foundry, that was on us. Um, any guesses as to why the isolation segment didn't work as, uh, as we thought it would? If you're thinking firewall, you'd be correct. So we worked really, really hard to make sure that we had all the firewall rules to get one of our major applications into the isolation segment, and then quickly realized that that much work was not gonna be feasible to get everything else in. We tried to move a couple things, it didn't go well. Then we realized, um, I'll use a bit of an illustration here, if you've ever been to a restaurant when a tour bus pulls up, all of a sudden the restaurant is full and nobody, nobody can, uh, can get any service, and you, know, you kind of have something like this. Well, we realized, hey, when the tour bus leaves, or when our largest application was no longer running in the main Cloud Foundry and was moved to the, isol the isolation segment, we didn't have to worry about it anymore. It was kind of like a tour bus leaving a restaurant. All of a sudden, the service gets better and there's tables free. So that isolation segment ended up being a success, not the way we had first intended, but it worked out really well for us. Another one of our pain points was around unsupported solutions. If Pivotal tells you, hey, this isn't a good idea, we won't support it, but you can do it anyway, Listen, they're telling you that for a very good reason. In our case, Firehose Syslog was one of our major pain points. The reason we had to use Firehose Syslog was uh, because the entry point to our logging system is Kafka. Our goal with Kafka was to bring logs into Kafka first and then anywhere we wanted to stream them uh, was merely another, uh, another thing reading off of Kafka. So rather than putting the load on the platform doing the work, the load is on Kafka, whether we want to stream to one place or three or four or 10. So we have good reason that we wanted Kafka and ended up having good reason to use Firehose Syslog, but we ended up scaling the platform quite a bit just to handle Firehose Syslog. Uh, Doppler, um, Cloud Controller, and a couple of other things all required extra scale just for the purposes of keeping Syslog up and running or keeping Firehose Syslog up and running. Uh, we are really looking forward to PCF2 because this problem goes away. I'm really excited not to support that anymore. Another one of our pain points was shared domain routing. For obvious reasons, most of the things in Cloud Foundry at Garmin require a route that ends in .garmin.com. So, ooh, easy solution. We'll create a shared domain, garmin.com, and then things like buy.garmin.com, connect.garmin.com, other things, dub, 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 they all just work. That was great, it worked for a long time until we started to do path-based routing. So when you have www.garmin.com slash running dynamics or slash cycling dynamics, which both happen to be marketing apps, that was okay. As long as you only have one org that's handling a, um, a path-based route on a shared domain, you're golden. But when we got to services.garmin.com and we started to put services into the platform, where not all of the orgs that are running services are the same, we, all, we have multiple groups building services, uh, we quickly ran into problems. The solution is private domains, which can be shared, so you end up with, instead of a shared domain, a shared private domain, and what we decided to do was have an ops org that owns all of our domains, and then we share those domains with other, excuse me, with other orgs as necessary. That, that worked out really well. Uh, it took us a little work to get there, uh, getting rid of that shared domain was, uh, was challenging, but it, but it worked out for us. Let's move to automation. One of my personal pain points was uh, managing the platform. So anytime that someone needed access to an org or we needed to, uh, we needed to give people uh, more quota, things like that, that all fell on me. I did, I did script all of that, but it was still me writing the script. So I, if I was on vacation or wanted to take lunch, uh, sometimes I, was, I ended up being the bottleneck for other groups, and I didn't, I didn't want to do that. I found a, um, a public a repo called CF Management that was uh, built by um, a Pivotal Services member. That's worked out really, really well for us. It handles org creation, space creation, uh, user access. It will do quotas. It'll handle domains. It didn't handle shared private domains, so that was a challenge that uh, we had to solve. So I learned Go and made a pull request, and now if you would like to do shared private domains using CF Management, you can. Another big win for us was automation. So one of our, one of our uh, you must be this tall to ride the ride uh, requirements was automation. So we used, uh, we used pipelines for all of our apps, uh, and those PCF2 foundations that, uh, that I just talked about 
all of those are deployed via pipeline. So from creating the ops manager, the ERT, all the tiles, all the users that are needed by the platform, such as uh, build pack management, uh, the user that CF management runs under, all of that happens off of uh, pipelines that are, that are uh, deployed by Concourse. All right, let's get to those cool numbers. So this is our first 100. Now, again, if you're a Comcast, you might be like, oh, how quaint. But remember that slash 24? That foundation took 100 requests a minute on one, I'm sorry, 100,000 requests a minute on one application. It actually peaked higher than that. Now, again, that's one application. That is an application called Connect that handles uh, most of the stuff with our wearables and our running apps and things like that. That app is really, really peaky. So on a Saturday or a Sunday when half the world goes for a run, we have a really, really bad time about two hours later when they all come back and they want to see that data. So uh, we wanted to make sure that this, this, this amount of traffic can be handled, but, but I mean, I could scale up VMs to handle this and just leave them there all the time, but that's a huge waste of compute. So the, other, the, the flip side of this is I needed to be able to scale up to handle this much and down. And so the auto scaler that we get with a Pivotal Cloud Foundry has been really great for that. So that compute is never wasted. It's consumed when I need it, and then I put it back into the pool and other apps can use it when they need it. So that's, that's uh, burst traffic. Now, uh, we also sustain a lot of traffic. We've, we've taken 100 million requests a day for for quite a while. Um, these numbers were pulled from, from March. So, so again, we have, we have peak scale where we need an auto scaler, and then we have heavy sustained scale where the platform just has to continue performing all the time. Uh, we are uh, obviously running mission critical applications. Um, our SSO or signal sign-on application is just one of the applications in the platform. That one has to be up 24 seven, whether you're a pilot and you want to uh, plan a flight or you want to sign in to connect with, uh, to, to sync your watch data, or various other applications that we run, SSO needs to be there all the time to handle all of that traffic. And then uh, for those of you with your acronym bingo cards, I've got a few there for you. Uh, does everyone know what GDPR is? Okay, all right, so you know uh, it's either finish GDPR on time or, or pay a lot of money. Uh, PCF has been a huge boon for us as we've um, written a lot of new code to handle GDPR. Um, being able to pipeline all that work and put it in the Cloud Foundry means that my developers don't have to focus on um, getting the code out there, they just have to focus on writing the code. Deploying at scale is another uh, challenge that we have enjoyed uh, working with. So we deployed 37 or 3,400 times in the month of March. So that's, that's a, for us, that's a pretty big number. Uh, and when you're deploying, if you have an app such as Connect where you have 100 instances running, you may not want to deploy that app with another 100 instances in a blue-green scenario. Um, if you're going to do that, your platform might have a bad time. Just take more for it. So uh, we found a plugin called Scaleover, and it wasn't quite what we needed. So again, uh, polished up some Go code and created a pull request. And what that plugin does is um, you deploy uh, your blue version of your application with five, 10 instances, whatever you want. Do the testing, make sure the application is, is good to go. And then the Scaleover plugin takes over, and what it does is uh, at parameters you set, you have your, your green instance, which has a huge number of instances, or a huge app with a huge number of instances. Your blue app, which doesn't have as many, and in, the, in, in any controlled fashion, the plugin does this. So you end up with your, your now green application having your 100 instances, and your former green application is, is now gone. And, the, and it does that without straining the platform too badly. So why does all this matter? There's a lot of, a lot of uh, benefit to the platform. One of the main reasons this matters, um, the benefits on the platform are huge and the care and feeding on it are small. There are three people at Garmin who, who uh, maintain Cloud Foundry. I'm one of them. It is not my full-time job. And the other two, they don't do it as a full-time job either. So we have now seven foundations uh, one of which is taking production traffic and many more that will be taking production traffic soon. And there are three of us that maintain those platforms. We've had, um, we've had some labs where we've had uh, both Pivotal and uh, ECS team, now, e uh, now CGI, come in. So some of the work has been done by more than three people, but the day-to-day -day is, is, a, is a really, really small team. Stability is another huge, huge benefit here. The platform just doesn't go down. We have had two outages in the last year. 
One of them was our fault for not planning well, and another one was an outage we had to take to update a core switch, and uh, we just, the network had to go dark. Now, having multiple production foundations made this a fairly much a non-event, so we moved a lot, of, a lot of production traffic to a different foundation and routed there, and we were in really good shape. I'm pretty sure this haiku is gonna live on in infamy for a really long time, but I wanna bring it up because it is, it's, it's life-changing for our developers. Whether we're running PHP, no, we don't do new PHP, we have legacy apps that we care about, uh, Java, Node, Static. My developer doesn't have to care what they're running, they don't have to build a special VM for it, it just runs. So I didn't, I didn't put the attribution on there, but uh, for those of you who are interested, Ansi Fakuri is the guy who wrote this haiku, and I think it's been floating around for quite a while. This is the one you wanna write down, culture change. Culture change is hard. We've heard that on the stage, uh, the keynote stage a few times, and it's, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do, but when we don't have to worry about where my code is gonna run, whether it's like, oh, I need to find a VM where I wanna run my, this new idea that I have, or I need to find a place to run this giant production application. In both of those cases, I don't have to care. I have a platform, and it runs my code for me. I can set up sandboxes easily for my developers, uh, one of the things Garmin's been focusing on for a couple of years is figuring out how we can get developers spending more time coding. And we've, we've done things as crazy as, hey, let's try and get developers out of as many meetings as we possibly can. That moved the needle a little bit, but Cloud Foundry has been the real needle mover for us because now uh, a production deployment isn't, uh, okay, let's make four tickets. We have to write instructions for the team that's going to actually deploy this to some VMs that I'm not allowed to touch. All of that's gone and my developers have pipelines where they deploy their code. So that, that's been the huge needle mover for us to get us back to writing code. That concludes my presentation. Thank you all for attending, and I'm open for questions. <laughs> yes? You mentioned that you're able to manage the tools mm -hmm. the foundation. What's the scale of that? Did you initially have more, and then scale down? Uh, the people? Uh, our initial team, I think, was four or five. We've had, uh, we've had a couple of uh, dojos, like I said, with, with uh, Pivotal and with ECS team, so those got as big as seven or eight, but we've never had a ton of people. Uh, I touched on it briefly, but the, we, we just spent a significant amount of time, I think we were in, in our lab for uh, four weeks, building out that, that concourse pipeline, and once we move everything to 2.0, Every single pipeline or every single uh, foundation we have will be deployed by a pipeline. And so then the, the work to get everything set up is now fill out the pipeline parameter file, which is a fairly decent sized file. But once that file is filled out, you create a jump box, you deploy, um, you, you deploy Bosch, and then and you deploy Concourse, of course, and then, you, and then you go. So it should be about a four hour manual effort to get a new foundation stood up. And that pipeline, as we were building the pipeline, we were actually standing up three foundations in parallel. What scale, how many microservices uh, I don't have a number, of, uh, an answer for you. Like, um, hundreds. I think our current production uh, app instance count is in the three to 500 range. And then we're over 1,000 in, in uh, non-production. And, and we're growing all the time. Um, at this point, one of our challenges is just how do, we, how, do we, how do we evangelize fast enough to get people onto the platform, or how do we, how do we get to the people that are interested? So the hunger is there, and, and, and we're, we sort of have the human limit of how do we get to these people and, and, uh, and train them for the platform. Question? Yes. Do you have, um, you talked about the culture change and getting things back into the pipeline and stuff. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm sorry, I missed some of your question. There's a microphone here. I, I don't have anyone to run it, though. <laughs> You're talking about culture change and yes. getting things to run much faster through the pipeline, uh -huh. great for developers. Uh, do you have visibility to the business side? Do you have 
situation where there's more interlocks and complexity at, on that side? And was there simplification and culture change as well? Yeah, we're still working on that piece. That's, those are some conversations that are going on now. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things we've been looking at is trying to, to build the, the product. Oh, that's going to fall. Oh, it didn't. We're trying to build the product owner role. And so, so I, I was actually working with a team recently where we have a BA, a PM, uh, we have a technical architect, and then we have a, um, another, another uh, role, I, I can't remember the title, but all of those roles, I, I, I drew up on the board for the team what, what all their roles are and what all those folks were doing, and it was kind of scary when I started putting dots between things that were overlapping, and eventually we saw that most of the roles in the room are, are overlap. So, so we're trying to, trying to make those teams smaller. But, but yeah, there, there's definite, definite friction there where uh, we have cases where the business wants to talk directly to the developers. We're trying to position a product owner in between those people so that you have the developers who know exactly what they need to work on. And then we're trying to position that product owner where the business can, can feed the product owner the large epic type requests like, hey, I want the app to do this. Not, hey, this button's not where I want it. That should be a bug. The product or the business should never be talking to a developer about that. That should be a support ticket that sits at the top of the backlog. The developer picks it up and out it goes. Yeah. Um, I saw that you still have some 1.10 foundations. I was curious yes. how you're handling upgrades. Are you doing in place or are you doing side by sides with the two O's? All the one X's, we've upgraded one uh, X in place. Uh, we've started with non prod, made sure everything was, was happy, and then we've deployed, uh, we've deployed the upgrade in place. And that's, that's been largely successful. Uh, we've, we've covered or uncovered some gotchas as we've deployed in the non prods, and then the prods have, have gone pretty well. Uh, I'm not sure if Pivotal would say it's a good idea to take a 1x to a 2x upgrade in place. The, the versions are so different that we felt that that wasn't a good idea. We also decided uh, on the development side, we're iterating everything. And, and we kind of realized when we first built the foundation, we had this idea that, ooh, this is awesome. We're done. We're, we're good. And that's just not the case. We, we, we need to iterate everything. So we're pipelining. Uh, there's a number of other things where we realized some of our mistakes in, in the 1X foundation, and we decided now's a really good time to, to scale up a lot. So in, like those slash 24s are no longer, we're, but there's multiple slash 23s as far as IP counts in the new foundation. And uh, just because it's, it's so different, we've decided that we're going to ask developers, we're going we're gonna to run them both in parallel for a certain amount of time and ask our developers, hey, I realize you've got your code running on the 1.0 foundation. I'd like you to run it on the 1.2 foundation, or the 2.0 foundation. That gives them time to, to update their pipelines, make sure everything's good before we actually run our production traffic there. And then once they're done, we're going to shut that 1.0 that, uh, foundation, or that 1.10 foundation down. But yeah, all of our previous upgrades were done in place. We just felt the 2x foundation was a big enough change that we didn't want to run in place. And then going forward, are you going to automate it? Yes. Yeah, the goal is that the pipeline handles everything. And that, that three-man team is, is able to, to focus on other things. I've got 12.30, so I think I'm almost out of time. Again, if you're interested in the developer or the uh, diversity luncheon, uh, I think it started 10 minutes ago. So I don't want to kick you out, but just want to make you aware if you're interested in that. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>